build this dream together. That was cool, right? Yeah. All right, let's hear it for Olivia one more time. That was great. So good, so good, so much fun. Um, hi, everybody. Missed you. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, all right, my name is Caleb, and I'm teaching pastor here, and along with Pastor Tyler in week one was Pastor Brian, our student pastor. We are in week three of this series entitled Power of Love. And so we have these fun songs every week. We're kind of getting in that in the 80s love song flow um, as we're going. And so it's interesting to think about, I was, I was considering the, the contrast between the last two songs we had sung here. Um, we had, first we sang the worship song, uh, One Thing Remains. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But this song, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now. And as Nate said, recorded by Starship. One of the writers of the song was a guy named um, um, Albert... Hammond. Uh, he was the writer of the song, and, and the, the, the origination of the song was that it was this kind of declaration of this unrelenting, committed love he had for his fiance that he was getting ready to marry. This nothing's going to stop us, nothing will ever break this unrelenting love. And so he says things like in verse 2 I'm so glad I found you. I'm not going to lose you. Whatever it takes, I will stay here with you, take you to the good times, see you through the bad times. Whatever it takes is what I'm going to do. So he writes these lyrics and there's this declaration of this steadfast, committed love he has. It's never, nothing's going to ever break it. The ironic thing is that Albert Hammond was writing this for his fiance, which was his girlfriend, that he was finally going to marry after a seven-year disastrous process of trying to divorce his previous wife. Um, it's a little irony of this, that Albert was promising a kind of love that he actually hadn't experienced himself or demonstrated himself in his own life. He was declaring this unrelenting never failing kind of love. And if you contrast that with the song we heard in the beginning, right, right before that, before offering, that one thing remains. One thing remains. His love never fails, never give up, never runs out on me. That this kind of love that Albert Hammond wanted to have and wanted to give but didn't really have to give, that is something that is found in, in God. As we talk about this power of love over the course of this series, uh, what I want to just point out to you right now is this kind of love that God calls us to, this kind of love He gives to us, it's kind of like currency. It's kind of like currency, like money. You can't give it until you've received it. If you don't have any, you can't give it. And in our own bro broken human nature, the kind of love described in 1 John, the kind of love we're talking about in this series, we don't got it in ourselves. We only have to first receive it from the one who supplies it, which is God the perfect love of God, and then we can give it to others. I want to pray for us, and we're going to jump into today's message, and then nothing's going to stop us. I'm going for like two hours preaching here. Just kidding. All right, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your perfect love for us. We thank you, God, that what we can't do in our own strength, what we couldn't produce in our own efforts, you did for us, and you continue to do for us with a perfect, unfailing, sacrificial kind of love. So this love that you poured out towards us, that has launched a revolution in this world, Lord, I pray that you would just cultivate that in our own hearts, that we would receive it from you and distribute it to others. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, what I said last, what I said is that the, this is week three. So week one, as you look at 1 John, we're going through the series, Power of Love, but we're looking through 1 John. You're going to see John emphasize some different things. Love versus hate, light versus darkness, truth versus lie. And in week one, Pastor Brian pointed us to the reality that all of those things, this perfect love that we're talking about, it finds its reality, its embodiment in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the centerpiece of all of this. And last week, as Pastor Tyler was speaking, he talked about this idea of living in the light as honest, authentic people. But in order to do that, there's this intersection of being fully known, being real and honest and known, but also experiencing perfectly being loved. Being loved. Fully known, truly loved, that in that we as Christians are called to be in the light. That we don't need to hide. We can be our authentic selves before God and before one another. And uh, near the end of that, I want to, uh, as we move into today's passage, we're going to look at verses 3 through 5 of chapter 2 and then move into a commandment. We all love our commands, so we're going to talk about a command here in a minute. So 1 John 2 3 through 5, here's what it says. John writes, And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, 
That person is a liar. Say liar. And is not living in the truth. It goes on and says this. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Now pause there for a second. So here's what he's saying. A liar. Now a liar is someone who tells or demonstrates something that is not true underneath, behind the scenes. Right? They present a false reality. So he says there is a false reality in those who claim to know God but do not obey him. Who claim to love God but do not obey him. You may have heard the phrase before. To know them is to love them. You might say that about somebody here at this church, I don't know, or about your spouse or your significant other. Oh, to know them is to love them. It's this idea that there's this being, this person, that to just meet them and get to know what they're like, you can't help it, you just love them. Well, John says something kind of like that here, but he develops it a little more. He says, to know him, regarding God, to know him is to love him. And to love him is to obey him. To know him is to love him, and to love him is to obey him. Now John's writing this letter, 1 John, and we wouldn't know this. The Bible, the chapters, uh, the books of the Bible don't have time stamps on them. But John, when he writes his books, it's been about 30 years since the rest of the New Testament was finished up writing. So when John writes, over those 30 years, some new problems have developed. Some new groups of people that are corrupting what it looks like to be a Christian. And there's a certain group that started to rise up in the day that John's writing, that he's addressing here, that have started to take Christianity and turn it into just an enlightenment of my intellect and, philosoph- and philosophy. That I, these people that are claiming to have this, the, the Greek word was gnosis, starts with a G, but gnosis, which is this, this secret knowledge, this mysterious revelation of what God's really like. And because of that, they are so spiritual and so much higher than everyone else. And they claim that Jesus, he's not really the son of God, but he came to show us the way to be really enlightened. I don't know why I stand on my toes when I say enlightened. It's like I'm experiencing it. All right, I'm above all of you, which I already am up here physically, not not spiritually or in any other way. All right, but people that start to feel very elevated. And this group of Christians saying, you know, real Christianity is if you'll just get this secret knowledge to be enlightened, to know God in these deeper ways than you do. What they end up doing is turning their Christianity into something only spiritual and very much not physical. Had nothing to do with anyone else. So this group of people that were so puffed up with their secret mystery revelations of God, they had become loveless, selfish, arrogant. They did not care for others. And so John here is is pressing on this to say, no, no. Faith in and faithfulness to God is not demonstrated in how much you can say you know about God, but is demonstrated in how much you obey Him. Faithfulness is not about how much you know, but how much you obey. And he's pressing on that. That he says, to know Him is to love Him, but to love Him is to obey Him. Now, John knows this. John, when he writes this letter, he's, in, he's like the oldest guy in the church probably at that time. He's, it's been years, 50 years since he walked around with Jesus. But he remembers back to when he was a teenager in the room with Jesus, following him around, and then he was in this room with Jesus, and, and it's, he writes it down in his gospel to describe this time. He's like 15, let's say, and he's sitting in this room with this Jesus he's been following for three years, this teacher, And over the next few days, he's going to find out he's the resurrected Son of God and Savior of the world. But he sat there with Jesus, and Jesus had looked him in the eyes and the other disciples, and had said things to them like we see in John 14. John 14, verse 15, that Jesus says, If you love me, obey my commandments. If you love me, obey my commandments. John 14, 21. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, the Father will love them. And in John 14, verse 23, Jesus had looked at teenager John and his buddies and had said, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. Anyone who does not love me will not obey me. It's this correlation that Jesus had said to John, Hey, those who love me and belong to me, aren't those who just claim they know a bunch of stuff about me. But it's those who obey me. Those who obey me. Now, here's what we find. Here's what I find. All right, I'm a parent. Also, I was a kid. 
and this is what I found before I was a parent when I was a kid, is that obedience, obedience is tested when God doesn't want to do the same thing as me. As a kid, obedience of my parents was not tested when they said, hey, Caleb, go grab an ice cream sandwich out of the freezer. I was like, yes, mother. And I would sprint over there in perfect obedience. I would grab that ice cream sandwich and maybe sneak a second one. All right? Obedience is easy. If my parents said, don't clean your room. Yes, yes, dad. Not a problem. All right? The challenge of obedience is actually when the person in authority and the person under that authority don't want to do the same thing. And Jesus says, if you love me, you obey me. And the challenge, as we get into this, we're going to find there's this commandment that Jesus, that Jesus gave to John that John's going to relay onto these Christians. And the challenge of that obedience is never going to be found when it's exactly what I want to do. The challenge is when God wants to do something that I don't want to do. And that's when obedience is challenged. It's when it's tested. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I found myself in, in a church like this, right? We have people who maybe we grew up in a very legalistic background, like do this, do this, do this if you want God to love you. Or we are even prone to that ourselves or we didn't need anyone to teach us, but we just automatically are wired to be very legalistic that, oh, if I don't do these 10 things, then God will stop loving me. That's not, that's not what the gospel is. The gospel is that God loved us first. The gospel is that God loves us perfectly. The gospel is God loves us forever. And we just trust in Him. Even in our brokenness and frailty, we're loved by Him. But what we don't want that to do is to turn into, and so there's nothing to obey. Because it's very clear in Scripture that as followers of Jesus, as people who belong to God, there is a way we are called to live. And so he, he's going to push into that now. So let's, let's look at verses, verse 6. And I want to say this. So verse 6, John says, Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And all I want you to see there is in verse 3 through 5, John says, Hey, if you, know, if you say you know God, you'd obey Him. If you love Him, then you'll obey Him. But then he takes this idea of obeying God. And jumps over and says, if you say you live in God, meaning have fellowship with Him, then you should live your life as Jesus did. So notice that because it's going to set us up for what's in the rest of this passage. That John creates this direct connection between obeying the law, or obeying the ways of God, and imitating Jesus. That obeying God and imitating Jesus. John's saying those are really one and the same. Obedience of God and imitation of Jesus. So verse 7, John keeps rolling, and he says this. Dear friends, I'm not, writing you a new I'm not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you've had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard from us, or you heard before. So what is John saying there? He's going to say something weird, by the way. He's going to say, this is an old commandment, and then next verse he's going to say, it's a new commandment. It's like, I'm sorry, John, make up your mind, dude. Um, but why does he say it's an old commandment you've had from the beginning? Well, John knows the Old Testament. All this stuff here that maybe you're familiar with, maybe you're not. But the first, about two-thirds of the Bible. He knows the Old Te Testament, and specifically the, the law. The first five books of the Bible. And the law given through Moses to God's people. And so when John says this is not a new commandment, it's something you've had from the beginning, he's referencing the fact that from the very beginning of God giving his law to his people, central to that was this command to love one another. One reference, if you want, you can write it down, would be Leviticus 19, verse 18, where God gave Moses this law for his people to say, love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus didn't all of a sudden, friendly Jesus skipping through the daisies, didn't all of a sudden say, love your neighbor as yourself. No, 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 that was the old commandment. That was what was always there, that God gave his people this law that they're to love their neighbors as themselves. So it's an old commandment, one you've had from the very beginning. And when we think about the law in the Old Testament, we often think about it like Jesus, or like God the Father, right? He's looking out at Israel, the Israelites, and goes, I don't want you to have any fun. So I'm going to give you these rules. And then he's like just slinging rules at these people just to ruin their lives. I swear that somehow how we've come to think about the law. When you think about the law in the Old Testament, I want you to imagine you're an Israelite and you, you know, you've just really come to know this God as this fire-bringing, earth-shaking, plague-conquering of Egypt, water-parting God. And you're like, 
Okay, what do you want me to do? And the law, like this central command, was a gift from that God. A gift from that God to say, hey, this is how I've designed life to work. That's what the law does. It reveals how God designed life to work for them. And not only that, it it shows them, here's how you honor this fire-bringing, earth-shaking God. And lastly, through that law, that was how they could represent to the world what this God was like. So John says, from the very beginning, the central command, the central way in which God's God's people could honor Him, could live life as He designed and represent Him to the world, was to love one another. This is an old commandment. Then he goes on in, in verse 8. And so, okay, so yeah, so this. So John says, to know him is to love him, to love him is to obey him. But then what we see is, and to obey him is to love others. There's a direct connection, this line of thinking that goes from saying I know God to being really expressed in how I interact with others. To know him is to love him, to love him is to obey him, and to obey him is to love others. But now John goes on to verse 8 and says, yes, it's an old commandment you have from the beginning, but it's also new. It's also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. So John says it's an old commandment because you've always had that written law code. From the very beginning of God's people, it's always said to love one another. But it's also a new commandment. And why? Because Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. The reason it's different is that John is saying, and this is something to understand from the New Testament, that Jesus, in Jesus, the written code became a living living being example. That instead of just being engraved on stones, that we could review these rules and these commands and instructions, Instead of just being engraved on stone, it was now embodied in a person. And now to follow that person's example was what it looked like to really obey that written code. That Jesus was the personification of that law lived perfectly. That no one had ever had a perfect, living, breathing, flesh and blood example to follow before. But now, in Jesus, they did. So it's a new commandment because it's following in the ways of Jesus. And John knew this because he remembered the new commandment when Jesus had given it to him, 15-year-old John, 50 years before he wrote this letter, along with his other buddies. In John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus looked at this group of disciples and he said to them, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. That wasn't new. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. That was new. That was new. See, no one had ever been told to love each other with a flesh and blood Lord and Savior directly in front of them who would just wash their feet, cleanse them of their their dirt and filth, taught them, lived out this life in front of them. Now, that that was new. Your love for one another, it says, will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So I always struggle with talking about phrases like love one another because I find myself... And many of us, if we've been around church for a little while, we think, oh, great, we're back in kindergarten. Love each other, all right? And we think, I'm already doing that. But what I want to challenge us with is, maybe we're not. Maybe we're not. And it's not kindergarten class. This is the PhD level of Christianity, is actually learning how to love the way Jesus does. And so if you read in John 13, if we took all the time to read it, you would find a bunch of things about Jesus in that story before he says, love one another as I have loved you. But here's four things that I want to point out to you. You, John knew this, that the Jesus kind of love is self-sacrificing. He saw it that day when Jesus had set alongside his robes and picked up the, the wash basin of the lowest servant, which we'll talk about as well. He saw it the next day John had when he had watched as that Jesus was arrested, beaten, bloodied, thorns shoved into his scalp, and then he was nailed to a cross and hung there for him. That the Jesus kind of love is self-sacrificing, not self-serving. Um, it's also others serving, right? It's others serving. That John, I would say, seared into his memory, even 50 years later as he writes this, is what it felt like for the water from the rag that Jesus, the Lord and Savior, held. 
to run down his leg and upon his feet and to feel what it was like to have Jesus, the one he'd followed, the one he thought was so great that the crowds cheered for him, to see him act as the humblest servant in the room and scrub the filth off John's feet. That this Jesus kind of love is others serving. It's also truth speaking. See, before Jesus said that, love one another as I have loved you, in that upper room they'd had a meal and they'd sat around and talked and Jesus had said things like, one of you is going to betray me and I know that. He'd said things to Peter like, hey, tonight you're going to deny me three times. I know the truth that's in you and I'll speak the truth to you. Truth speaking. And it's unfailing. Now maybe John didn't know that in that room. But he'd come to find it now. For 50 years he's been living in relationship with Jesus by his spirit. And John has experienced that in all his failings and mistakes, this love that Jesus had professed to him had never failed him once. When we start thinking about loving each other as he loves us, it starts to press on the reality that, in, that maybe we aren't doing that after all. So what we often have is an admiration, a temporary, fleeting, conditionally based admiration for others. I really like you until I don't. Till you tick me off or you don't agree with me. Or we have a love that isn't rooted in truth speaking, but we call it love, but it's very tolerant and we don't speak the truth even when it's really, really needed because we just want to have a comfortable relationship. But we're called to love one another as he has loved us. So as John lays out this one command, but this is how we demonstrate we know and love him, is we obey him. How do we obey him? We love each other as he has loved us. He now goes into, in verse 9 through 11, how we break, those, break that law. He says, if anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. Remember those. We'll come back to that in a moment. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by darkness. So John kind of lays out here, hey, if you want to break the commandment, here's a little how-to. Here's a how-to break the commandment of the Lord. Which hopefully we're all like, I don't want to do that. All right, good. I hope you're, you're thinking that. How to break the commandment of the Lord. And he gives you three ways. Number one, you can hate someone else. That's a way to break the commandment of the Lord. Now you might say, I don't hate anybody. Great. I do probably. I mean, there's probably somebody I could think of. All right. You might think, I don't hate anybody. But, but that's because we have that word hate like associated with something we would never do. But the Greek word, the Bible, New Testament was written in Greek. The Greek word here for hate it means basically having a malicious intent for someone else. Desiring bad for them. Desiring bad for them. Now we start to get in that category where it's like, I mean, I kind of hope they get what they deserve. They're going to get what's coming to them. All right. And we start to be like, oh man, I have thought that in my head. <laughs> I wouldn't say I hate someone, but I definitely have ways I've wanted bad. I've had ill intent for other people. John says well, that's a great way to break the commandment of the Lord. That's darkness and not light. And also we see that to be, be unwilling to sacrificially serve, that's a way we can make sure we can break this commandment is by an unwillingness to serve others or to sacrifice anything that's costly to us. Now for me, that doesn't usually come up on a Sunday morning. To be honest with you, um, it, some weeks I'm really tired or I'm struggling and I feel like I get up here and I'm like, oh, I feel out of my, out of my element. But there's never been a Sunday I'm down here and I'm like, nope, I am not going up there to speak. Right? Cross my arms like a toddler. You've all, if you've got a toddler, you've experienced that. Right? That's stubborn. I've never done that. But there are plenty of times on a Tuesday where I've crossed my arms to the Lord and been like, nope, I am not going to do the dishes. Or at 2 a.m., cross my arms and say, nope, I am not going to sacrifice and get up with the kid. Or, yeah, my wife's sitting there and she's amening. It's weird. I can see her over there. No, I'm just kidding. She's not. Nothing's going to stop us now. <laughs> all right. All right. There are plenty of times where I'm at work and I, and I feel this desire. Someone wants my time and I don't want to sacrifice it. Right? So, again, th there's the times where it's easy, but there's the times where it isn't. And this is a great way to break the commandment of the Lord. 
And lastly, is causing someone else to stumble. Now I said first service, I'll say it again. The only time I ever really heard that passage talked about very much is in a really wrong way. I was, I was in youth group or youth pastor, and it's not wrong, but it's just really not, not a fair use of this text. And it was only used to tell young women how to dress around the young men. Don't cause anyone to stumble, right? It's like, what? That is not what John's talking about here. To cause someone to stumble, what John is talking about here is hindering someone from doing the good they're called to do. Hindering someone from doing good. If to hate is to want bad for someone, to cause someone to stumble is to hinder them from the good God has called them to do. And we can do that in a lot of different ways. We can do that in a lot of different ways. We can do it by, by actually causing, like tempting them to do what's wrong, inviting them in to do what's, do what's wrong. Maybe slandering. I come to you and I talk badly about someone else. And I am inviting you to break the commandment of Jesus with me. I'm causing you to stumble. Or hindering you from doing what's right by, by you know, you want to go serve, but I already, I'm like, I mean, don't you already do enough? I mean, you're really busy, and I'd really, can't we just go to Top Golf um, or whatever, right? I could hinder you from doing something good God is compelling you to. There's different ways to cause people to stumble by getting in their way or by inviting them to break the command together. These are all these different ways, are ways to break the commandment of the Lord. And so if you're like me, you're like, oh, thank you, Caleb. I feel burdened now with the reality I am breaking it. So let me encourage you, please reread the earlier verses in John, which tell us already, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And if anyone does sin, in chapter 2 it says, we have an advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrifice for all of our sins, past, present, and future. But if we recognize I'm breaking this commandment, then the natural response for those who love God is to say, help me be obedient again. Change me, Lord. Change me, Lord. John finishes up this passage with just making this statement in verses 12 through 14. And I'm going to read this and then make a couple statements to close, close us out. 1 John 2, 12-14, he says this, I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I've written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I've written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. This love that Jesus calls us to, he first gave to us. And this Jesus kind of love is a revolutionary kind of love that lights up a dark world. What does it look like? And here's what we see, that the Jesus kind of love is a result of what Christ has done. If Christ had none at first, he says, I write to you because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. So that's why I'm writing you this commandment, to love each other. Because if Jesus hadn't done it first, we couldn't do it at all. And this love that lights up the world, this Jesus kind of love, is a response to what we know about him. It's a response to what we know about him. As we come to know him more and more, what we most get to know is this unrelenting, never failing, never stopping, never giving up love that he has expressed to us both in the cross and in the permanent establishment of relationship that we have with him as his kids. But lastly, it's kind of a surprise that this Jesus kind of love is also an assault on the evil one. It's part of this battle against the enemy. Later in 1 John, John is going to say that this is why the Son of God came to destroy the works of the evil one. And what we find out is, what is a central way that this, this kind of revolutionary rebellion against the evil one is happening? Through people loving each other the way Jesus has loved them. Sacrificially, serving, speaking truth in an unfailing, relentless kind of way. There are people who wrote in early church history, they kind of have records of what was going on in the church in the first few hundred years as things were going on. And and these historians can tell us stories about when John was really old and what he was doing. And as John got very old, it was passed on by some of his disciples that he would come to a church gathering, and, and it looked a little different than this, but he'd come to a church gathering. And, and you can imagine if one of the original disciples were in the room, 
I wouldn't be talking right now. Okay, we'd be like, hey, well, let's see what that guy's got to say. So John, at this point, had become physically very feeble and worn down. He was, he was very weary, didn't have much physical strength. But they wanted to hear what he'd have to say. So every time they'd gather, they'd invite him to say something. And the historians tell us that the young men would go and they'd help John up and they'd bring him to the front of the room and they would set him before the people. And John would look at them and over and over would reiterate the same message. If he had one thing to say to people that he knew would be a part of changing the world and be a part of the mission of Jesus, and he would look at them and he would say, little children, love one another. The young men would come and they would help John up and get him back to his seat. That John, reflecting on 50 years of living out relationship with this Jesus, reflecting on three years spent as a teenager following this Jesus through the dusty streets of Palestine, when he was asked, what's one thing you would say to us as God's people? He said, I tell you, obey the commandment of Jesus to love one another just as he has loved you. We're going to sing this song. I'm going to pray for us as we, as we go to do that. As we sing this song, it, it's called Remember. And what I want us to do is remind ourselves of the way Jesus has expressed his love towards us. And I want, I want us to invite him to search our hearts, to show us any ways in which we can better obey this beautiful, perfect commandment to love each other as he has loved us. Let me pray. Lord, we love you, but we love you imperfectly, and you love us perfectly. Lord, we love one another, but we love one another imperfectly, and you love us perfectly. So, Lord, I pray that as we sing this song, as we move towards the end of our time together, that you would press upon our hearts any ways that we can change to become more like you, and any ways that we need to be reminded of what your perfect love truly looks like. In Jesus' name.